Hello and welcome to Ocean Witness, the series where we grapple with some of the biggest issues relating to our seas. I'm Sophie Duca. And I'm Simon Watt. And today we're looking at industrial fishing. Industrial fishing. Sounds scary. Sounds fishy. I think you're really going to make a splash this season with your fish puns. Hopefully we'll get people hooked. Let's put those fish jokes to the seabed. Agreed. Coming up on today's show, we'll explore the human cost of industrial fishing, we'll see Greenpeace activists confront a super trawler, and we'll learn all about the amazing manta ray with Andrea, queen of mantas. But first, we're heading to West Africa. This is a story of plunder and a fishing community struggling to survive due to the destructive fishing practices of foreign companies. Oui, le poisson est la principale source de nourriture car la quasi-totalité des Sénégalais vivent dans le secteur de la pêche avec, une, avec un besoin en protéines animales de 28 à 29 kilos par personne et par année. situation des salitiers, des usines de farine de poisson et d'huile de poisson tue les communautés de pêche à grande force parce que la plupart des, des femmes transformatrices rencontrent des difficultés de même que les pêcheurs artisanaux. J'aimerais dire au monde sur la situation actuelle que les problèmes se sentent de plus en plus et que la quasi-totalité des jeunes qui s'activent dans le milieu de la presse ont tendance à quitter le secteur parce qu'ils ne trouvent plus des revenus nécessaires pour nourrir leur famille. Je ne suis pas un toxique, mais je ne suis pas un gars de la vie. C'est ce qui a causé l'immigration clandestine. C'est ce qui a été fait. Il y a une solution, il y a une garage. Il y a une garage qui a été fait. Pour que nous puissions aller au Sénégal, il y a des pieds qui ont été fait. C'est ce qui a été fait. Les autres communautés doivent se réunir. C'est en se réunissant qu'on qu peut atteindre le maximum de résultats en termes de sensibilisation de combat pour que 
les communautés qui s'activent dans ce milieu ne soient plus, en, plus vulnérables. And now, to tell us more about the situation, we are joined from Greenpeace Africa by Dr. Ibrahima Sisse. Hello, Ibrahima. Hello. Hello. Why are the local people in West Africa going short to fish? The situation in West Africa is a bit uh, complicated because the, the, the fish is going to export first, is going to fish mill plants, and is going to all this... Uh, what is not evaluated is the illegal fishing activity in the region. So you have a lot of vessels that are fishing without having right to access to fish. You have fish mill industry that in the region, there are about 15, 50. It's a lot for the stock here. So it's a huge number of fish stock that is going outside uh, on the, uh, it's going outside the, the, the region while the community cannot have access to fish. And all this situation, you add the issue of climate change because the temperature of sea is high light, is, is, is growing. You have some change on the, on the, on the dispersion of, of the fish stock. Uh, scientific studies show that uh, the artisanal fishery activity is 40 times more important than industrial work. It means when you evaluate the value, the chain of value, from the, the small scale boat where you have around 10 people, you have the family behind in the beach waiting to take the fish to process it, to sell it in the market. You have people take it in the inland. So all these people depend on this activity. So it's the impact is huge compared to the, to the vessels, to the industrial vessel. So what we do in Greenpeace, we try to show that all these people depend on the activity on this small scale boat. To dive deeper into that, how do you think we could fix this situation? What work is Greenpeace undertaking? As Greenpeace, we are requesting from the government to publish the list of vessels fishing in Senegal. So we can know who is fishing and who has right to fish in Senegal. We are also requesting the shutdown of fish meat factories. And uh, to be clear that fish meat factories cannot use fresh fish or fish that is for human consumption to process it to make fish meal and fish oil for to feed uh, livestock and and this aquaculture and pigs etc in 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 Europe and in Asia and we say this is not ethical this because when they come to the market they put a better price so the fishermen prefer to sell their product to the fish meal factory and the women stay without having access to fish so this is not a, a good situation and it impacts a lot to this woman because they used to have this activity to have some money for their family to support their kids, etc. We are also requesting a decree to recognize women processors' jobs in uh, in Senegal so they can have the same right like everybody working in any institution. Uh, the last thing is uh, we think that the West Africa region need a management body to ensure that the share stock and uh, the illegal activities, the illegal fishing in the region can decline and can stop and the share stock will be managed sustainably for the benefit of community and people that depend on them. Thank you so much, Ibrahima, for telling us about the situation in West Africa. Now we're going to get to grips with a particular kind of fishing vessel, the super trawler. Sophie, what's a super trawler? So, super trawlers are fishing ships that are over 100 meters long and they fish by dragging huge nets behind them. And this form of fishing, well, it's horribly destructive. Yeah, super is not a good enough word, they should call it large and awful. This summer, the Esperanza headed to the North Sea off the coast of the UK to send a very powerful message. Super trawlers could be described as floating fish factories. Their idea is to go out, suck up hundreds of tons of fish, process them, pack them up, and keep fishing. In actual fact, you could fit about a dozen jumbo jets into one net. You have to stand back and think about that, just how much fish these vessels are capable of catching. Oh, it's like a pack of wolves surrounding a three-legged caribou. Tracking these vessels down now, thankfully, is actually much easier than it used to be. 
not surprisingly, we found the Helen Marie fishing like there's no tomorrow. We're going to come up close to her, see how much gear she has in the water. Sir, are you aware that you are fishing in a marine protected area? That we are asking you formally now to retrieve your fishing gear and vacate this marine protected area. Can you copy that transmission over? We will be taking non-violent direct action against your vessel to stop this industrialized, destructive fishing. I understand that you are not responding. That is Esperanza standing by in 60. Help. Okay. When we think about fishing, about fishermen, about how brave they are to go to sea, it's actually come a long way from a roughy tufty guy in a pipe and a small boat bobbing around in the seas. These things are spaceships. They have technology behind them. They can hoover up thousands of tons of fish in one go. There is simply no comparison to them and what has gone before. The world is 70% oceans. We just simply can't afford to allow this to happen any longer. We need to get tough. We need to have legislation with teeth and we need to stop these modern day pirates because that's an actual fact what they are. They are strip mining our oceans there. That was intense. Yeah, but did you know that you can hunt for super trawlers from the comfort of your own home? No, how might I do that? Well, we can do it hands-free thanks to our top tier technical team using the power of the internet. And as we've been looking at West Africa, if we could just zoom in there. Sure, let's Mauritania. go to just off the coast of Mauritania and you can see a bunch of super trawlers. Many of them are flying what's called flags of convenience. So that means they might be owned or crewed by people or companies from one country but they're registered somewhere else, which makes it very difficult to get a full picture of what they're doing. From these images, it looks like they're fishing, probably targeting the same fish populations that we saw in Senegal, in direct competition with coastal communities. To search for super trawlers yourself, there are lots of options online, but we've been showing you a website called Marine Traffic. This episode, our creature of the week is the mighty manta, and here to tell us more about them is Dr. Andrea Marshall, joining from Mozambique. Hi. Hi there. First off, Andrea, what actually is a manta ray? Well, manta rays are fish, but they're cartilaginous fish. So their skeleton is comprised of cartilage, not bone. So like the same stuff in your nose or in your ear. And that's what makes them so flexible and wonderful. But yeah, they're relatives of sharks, but instead of being kind of cylindrical, they're flat. Flat sharks, perfect. <laughs> Can you tell us about the very first time you had an encounter with a manta ray up close? Yeah, I can actually remember the very moment and I wasn't anticipating uh, encountering one. I was actually doing work with sharks and I looked and I felt something over my shoulder and I looked back um, and this thing was barreling at me um, down you know, just across the sand and it looked like the biggest underwater bird I had ever seen. It was so graceful and so big and it just blew my mind. I was gobsmacked. I, I could hardly even take a photo. It was just so beautiful. And I think I was about 16 or 17 at the time, but that moment I think helped define the rest of my career. I just thought to myself, what an incredible animal this is. I think the size of them really surprises people. I mean, they can get up to about seven meters. I've seen seven meter individuals in the wild. So you're talking about maybe like 21 feet or so, 22 feet. Um, and it really does feel like some sort of alien spacecraft. You know, they can light out the sun when they go over you and 
Um, you know, luckily they're very gentle giants. Um, otherwise it would be incredibly intimidating because they're very, very large. How do you distinguish different manta from other manta? How, how is it easy to tell them apart? That's actually, it's, it's actually really fortunate because every single manta has like a different pattern of spots on its underside. Um, it's very similar to like the human fingerprint. We call them belly prints um, because they're on the stomach. Um, and luckily you can actually really uh, differentiate between different individuals really easily. So I can, uh, you know, all of the thousand mantas in our population here in Mozambique, I know um, by sight, um, maybe not all of them around the world, but uh, certainly the ones here in our population we can recognize. Well, if you're going to recognize them, I have to ask, do you have any favorites? <laughs> yeah, I do, actually. I mean, one of the fun things about them is it's almost like the ink blot test where, you know, you start to see different things in the spot patterns over time. Um, so you can kind of name them accordingly. And, and I, I suppose my favorites are the ones that have, I, I suppose, the silliest names. Um, you know, there's a, we have Dracula. I have one that looks exactly like Homer Simpson's head. Um, I have <laughs> one that has a five, a zero, and a, and a bite mark out of it. So I called it 50 Cent. Um, yeah, we have a lot of really fun mantas here. That's incredible. So you know the manta locals in Mozambique pretty well, but how well-traveled are manta rays in general? Do they go very far afield from their homes? Yeah, yeah, I know this population really well because I've been studying it for about 20 years. Um, and part of wanting to learn more about this population led me to start finding out how far they, they travel. You know, do, do they stay in Mozambique all the time or are they traveling abroad? So we started using this really advanced technology these like satellite tags maybe 20 years ago before anyone else was really doing it. And you basically put these little tags on mantas. It, it, it tells you where they are every about 10 seconds. Uh, it takes all kinds of information um, about them around the water that they're swimming in. And you can reconstruct tracks and tell exactly where they go. And they go thousands and thousands of kilometers in different directions. Um, and when we first started putting the tags on, we thought they were surface dwelling animals and they started making dives of up to, you know, over a thousand meters from the surface. So they became overnight one of the deepest diving fish in the world as well. Um, so yeah, they, they are athletic animals that, that travel the world's oceans regularly. I mean, not across ocean basins, but they travel up and down continental coastlines and things like that. Could you tell us what are the threats to mantas like this? Yeah, unbelievably. I mean, these are such giant and, and gentle animals. You, you know, they're everyone that, that dives with them. They're great for tourism. You would think that everybody loves mantas, but unfortunately, just like the sharks, um, there there's a huge trade for them. And in the case of a manta, they actually extract the gill plates in their mouths that they use to filter all of the little, you know, plankton that lives in the water. Um, and there's a trade for the, that in Asia. And so they're being harvested unsustainably around the world and populations are crashing so much so that they're really considered a threatened species globally now, or all of the species are considered threatened now. And there's also a lot of indirect fishing pressure. So people that may be fishing for something else like tuna where they're captured incidentally. Um, but you know, there's a lot of other impacts to them too. I mean, we definitely think that climate change is gonna pay, play a role and um, ocean acidification may impact their food supply in the future. But even just how we're developing coastlines, we're taking away all of the habitats they have along coastlines um, and replacing them with you know, um, cities and, and, and jetties and um, inlets and bays. And, you know, so we're having a huge impact there as well. And also all the boat traffic, we're seeing a lot of uh, boat strike injuries um, uh, to the mantis as well. So there's all kinds of threats they face. And one of the newest cryptic threats is, is the impacts of microplastic, which we've just shown last year uh, that mantis are actually ingesting this plastic and, and are probably impacting them that way as well. So we can see why we want to protect these animals. What can actually be done? Well, you know, we've been working really hard on that exact thing for the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, we've studied all kinds of aspects about them so that we can list them on the international conventions like CMS and CITES to prevent their trade. Um, you know, and now we're working country by country to try and protect them. We've actually are just about to announce in Mozambique now that they're formally protected now after about 20 years of lobbying efforts here. Um, so, you know, you take it country by country, but the most important thing about mantas and other large marine animals, whale sharks, things like that, is we have to create really large um, marine protected areas in order to, to provide enough protection for them because they move around, as I told you before. Thank you so much, Andrea. That was extremely enlightening. You're absolutely welcome. It was a pleasure. Now, it's not just the environment that suffers when illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing takes place. There's an increasingly terrible and human cost too. In the high seas, far from scrutiny, some shocking human rights abuses are taking place. 
poor migrant fishers from Southeast Asia, are often drawn into modern-day slavery at sea. Here are some of their stories. And just a warning, that this video does contain images of human suffering that some viewers might find distressing. Orang makan ikan tuna, sashimi yang harganya mahal. Apakah berpikir ini dari mana? Bagaimana proses dan ada perbudakan ataupun pelanggaran ikan itu nyuri atau tidak? Nama saya Zainuddin dari Desa Demang Harjo, Kabupaten Tegal. Di desa saya sendiri kebanyakan semua pekerja pelaut, entah ada yang lokal dan ada yang dibanyakan luar negeri. Karena berdasarkan pendapatan untuk bekerja di kapal lokal sangat kurang dalam penghasilan. Jadi lebih baik saya mencoba untuk bekerja di luar negeri. Saya berangkat barang dari Pemalang itu ada lima orang. Kita bekerja kan di satu kapal 15 orang. Kenapa yang kalau setiap ngisi umpan itu orang Indonesia yang suruh bekerja, bukan orang lain. Jam istirahat, Saya tidak dikasih makan. Saya tanya, maaf, di sini saya bekerja. Saya juga pengen waktu istirahat. Lai, lihat yang lain tuh pada makan dan istirahat. Tolong saya minta istirahat dan makan. Terus itu saya ngamuk. Udah, saya tendang pintunya. Bosnya datang. Saya tanya, saya minta pertanggungjawaban jawaban dari anda. Anda memperkerjakan saya, berarti harus anda berhak memberi makan saya. Ini jelas-jelas ini perbudakan, pemerasan, tapi pemerintah tidak ada. Selama ini pemerintah siapa yang mau bertanggung jawab tentang APK, tidak ada yang jawab. Kerja itu jam 12 siang sampai jam, 3, jam 4 sampai jam 5 lah, itu baru selesai. Terus itu cari ikan, ikan tuna, ikan marlin, ikan hiu, tapi hiunya itu Siripnya diambil, bajunya dibuang. Apapun ikannya, pasti dibabat habis. Terus kadang-kadang waktu yang mau nyandar, itu hiu, sirip, badan nggak dibuang. Soalnya mau sandar, pendapatan hiunya itu banyak. Sampai berapa-berapa ton itu. Kerjanya itu sampai pai minimal minimalnya itu jam 6 pagi jadi 12 jam itu belum belum dengan packing. Ya sekitar 15 sampai 18 jam itu. Itu berlangsung cukup lama ya untuk sumi itu itu karena memang pas musimnya. Tapi di hari berikutnya mulailah mencari ikan dengan jaring kan, dengan jaring. Itu tidak berlangsung lama cuma satu minggu. Kemudian mungkin dapat informasi dari kapal yang beroperasi Ini cumi lagi banyak, akhirnya beroperasilah cumi. Tidak bisa itu yang namanya troll itu bertahan lama itu nggak bisa. Padahal di situ udah dijelaskan di PKL kita itu kapalnya kapal kapal troll, kapal jaring. Jadi sang kapten itu memberikan sebuah kalimat bahwasanya kalian boleh istirahat ketika kalian itu sudah benar-benar tidak bisa jalan dan tangan kalian sudah tidak bisa bekerja. Itu statementnya seperti itu. Jadi sakit pun ya tetap aja suruh bekerja. Sama aja kita kerja rodi lah, masih kerja rodi itu di kapal. Terburuknya lagi adalah di kapal sebelah yang 355, Hantong 355, ketika terjadi kematian sebanyak tiga orang. disebabkan oleh makan yang espayet itu dijelaskan oleh dokternya makan yang espayet kemudian minum air yang tidak layak minum itu kemudian dengan dalam jangka waktu yang lama hampir enam bulan kita itu minum dengan air embun yang keluar dari AC bayangkan itu kita buat untuk masak untuk minum untuk mandi karena apa kita ABK dari Indonesia dan Filipina itu dibatasi untuk pemakaian air bersih Nah, kemudian selang dua bulan, satu bulan setengah dia meninggal lagi tuh. Singkat ceritanya sama seperti itu dibawa ke rumah sakit ketika sudah parah, sudah pingsan, sudah uh, step di kapal, sudah sampai keluar busa. Ketika meninggal itu, si kapten kapal itu enak sekali ngomong dengan bahasanya dia. 
nggak apa-apa meninggal yang penting keluarganya itu uh, dapat uang dari kami seperti itu berapa harga nyawa yang bisa terbayarkan gitu loh dengan dengan uang itu and joining us now from Jakarta is Greenpeace Oceans campaigner Arafia Nasutian hi Araf Araf hi the footage we just saw Araf was very shocking and you've been working on a campaign to try and understand and investigate exactly what's going on can you tell us the extent of these abuses? Yes, if you could imagine, uh, it's uh, in every ocean, uh, we have Indonesian migrant fishing crew working on board, yeah? either in the uh, Taiwanese fishing vessel, or maybe Chinese fishing vessel, or maybe in European uh, uh, fishing vessel. So in our numbers, at least roughly, there are 200,000 uh, Indonesian uh, fishers working abroad. And uh, uh, some of them, about 75% is uh, uh, working on the fishing vessels. And what makes Southeast Asia in particular such a hot spot for this kind of exploitation? Yeah, there are two main uh, points that uh, actually we need to uh, uh, rely on. The first one is uh, the environmental degradation also in our region. So because, uh, you know, if our environmental, maybe let's, let's say coastal fisheries is being exploited so much yeah, by the mining, also by pollutions. So there is uh, uh, less of job, yeah, less of fish that uh, can be uh, uh, fished by our, uh, by our people. And then they need to face uh, another reality. They need job, yeah, they need food. And then uh, come, uh, come up with uh, some opportunity to uh, working abroad. Can you take us through the sort of timeline of people ending up on these boats? How do they get there? The general uh, as, uh, a pattern of this one is that they try to uh, find the fisher from the small village. Let's say in north of uh, J uh, uh, Java Islands, uh, is, uh, they spread uh, the, the brokers, we call it, and the brokers find, try to find the, 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 uh, the fishers, yeah? and then they, they uh, give them some promise. If you could uh, join uh, or working on the fishing vessel, you can uh, be paid uh, well, you can get uh, well conditions, but uh, all of those uh, promises are actually is, is not true because um, most of them uh, cannot get their uh, paid salary, even maybe uh, even written in the contract, but they don't get any uh, salary uh, payment uh, uh, in, 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 in exact amount that already written in the contract. So, it's in, in fact so many deceptions uh, and also yeah, you, uh, uh, exploiting the vulnerabilities of those people uh, and then uh, because they need the job and then they just uh, receive the, the, job or, the, the job offer. But actually when they uh, uh, arrive in one boat or one in one in fishing vessel, they, they cannot uh, escape anymore because they're already in the, in the boat. So I think that's a situation that's a common uh, situation that we, uh, we, uh, we found based on some uh, our in investigation and also our interviews with the uh, fishers. Yeah. It seems from what you're saying that environmental justice and social justice are going hand in hand and a strong global ocean treaty would help us respect both yeah. the ocean life and human life. Yeah, it's, 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 it's very valid because uh, I think uh, why we need uh, a, a call yeah, to a global uh, access protection is not only because we want to save the the whale, we, we are, or the save the uh, shark, or save our uh, pristine uh, ecosystem, but also is for our human uh, beings. If we can uh, uh, ensure the ocean protection better in the high seas, uh, uh, we are also uh, can do better in our coastal uh, ecosystem. So I think it's, it, it could do, go hand in hand, and we need to, to see this could be uh, achieved, yeah? uh, because uh, if we can, uh, if we ignore uh, uh, the social aspect of those uh, uh, hexes protection. I think uh, we cannot answer the, the basic uh, uh, principle that we need to save our humanity. Thank you so much, Arif. Thank you, Arif. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now it's time for Life on Board, and we are going on board the Esperanza to meet deckhand Victor. We are the people of the ocean. I grew up running on white sandy beaches, fishing. My name is uh, Victor Pickering, and I'm from the Fiji Islands. And there was this moment that uh, in university, we had a Japanese lecturer who was trying to teach me all these knots. <laughs> and then I told him, like, 
I'm not in for your knots, you know, because I'm not going to end up on a ship or all these things. And well, life turned and it ended up to be on a ship as a deckhand. I studied uh, marine science, fisheries, marine resource management. I felt like I needed to do more for the, for the ocean in terms of policy. So that was my main focus because I saw the threats that, uh, that was happening around me. So I joined the ships in 2013, so it's been quite a long time now. I've been old. <laughs> the best part about it, you get to visit a lot of countries and see different people, you get to get inspired, you get to learn new things as well. <laughs> Every country should protect their own ocean because uh, protecting your own ocean means protecting your people. It's an amazing bit to think they'd end up on a ship because they've got incredible posture. Yeah, good poise. I'd have fallen in. And that's all we've got time for this week. Remember that we need to put pressure on governments around the world to agree on a strong global ocean treaty at the UN. Check out the links below or above this video to find out how you can get involved. We thought we'd leave you with the soothing sights and sounds of some of nature's best fishes, Atlantic grey seals. This was filmed this summer in the UK in the marine protected area of Lundy. Until next time, bye! bye.